Okay, good morning or good afternoon wherever you are and welcome to our Polar Connect event with uh, Nick LaFave and uh, um, the research team up there at Tulick Field Station. Um, today is July 9th, 2012 and uh, we're excited to hear all about the work that Nick and uh, Amanda and the rest of the team have been doing up at Tulick Field Station in Alaska. Before we get started, um, just to give you a little bit about um, background about the program um, and why Nick is up in Alaska. He's part of Polar Trek, Teachers and Researchers Exploring and Collaborating. And to give you um, some background about that, because um, we have some other teachers that might not be familiar with the program, we place teachers um, with researchers in the polar regions, both the Arctic and the Antarctic, and it's a National Science Foundation funded program through the Office of Polar Programs. Um, every year we've been matching at least 12 teachers up with researchers, both in, um, like I said, the Arctic and the Antarctic. And the purpose of this is so that the teachers like Nick can get um, hands-on experiences, um, learn how to use the science tools, and um, hopefully um, bring that knowledge that he's gained back into the classroom. And, uh, just be a better um, science teacher um, by having this experience. The other reason why we have this program is to help researchers um, understand what is happening in the classroom, and it gives researchers like Amanda here an idea of what it is to be a science teacher in a K-12 classroom, and, and uh, hopefully um, it improves um, their um, their skills as well as learning how to do outreach and engage students when they go into the classroom. They pick up some tips and, and uh, pointers from the teachers that they're working with. And all of this is to hopefully um, also give people across the globe a better understanding of what is happening in the polar regions and why it's important for them, um, people such as yourselves, to understand what the issues are and what's happening and how it impacts you um, wherever you may be. So um, our, if you're a teacher that's listening today and you're interested in Polar Trek and doing a similar experience, uh, I know Nick has some slides on this in a while, but Polar Trek um, um, will be advertising and announcing a new application period for teachers and researchers coming up um, in August. So you can check, check that out on our Polar Trek website. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nick and Amanda, and um, you have this uh, slide here, Nick, so I'll turn it over to you. Right, thanks, Janet. Um, since this is geared at teachers, one of the questions that teachers have asked a lot about this um, process is how you, get, how you get involved and what the application process is all about. So in about September, um, somewhere around there was when I initially filled out my application. Um, I was really excited about it just based on the questions that were asked in it. Um, I, I felt really good about the types of questions that were being asked. Um, and mailed that or uh, sent that in electronically actually. And around November I received notification that from the over 200 applicants, um, 42 of us were finalists. So I was quite excited around that point. And then while I was home visiting family for the holidays, um, I got a great, question, or a great uh, phone call from Sarah asking if I was interested in being one of the people to interview for this spot. Um, and immediately I was quite excited. So yeah, I did an interview and then sometime in January found out the good news. So it's, it's quite a process and even just the application process I think is good in terms of, uh, you know, it costs you nothing and it allows you to uh, be a little bit reflective. So even the application process is something that I'm, I was quite happy with. Um, moving on though to, this was in February, and I want to point out a couple things um, that make Polar Trek I think a little bit different. It's um, that picture with a little, I put a little finger beside it there, um, is that orientation. In fact, those top two are for Polar Trek, and uh, we head up to Fairbanks for two weeks, or two, I'm sorry, one week, what am I thinking? Um, for one week of orientation. and. Uh, feel very, very well prepared before you go into the field, um, which makes us, I think, a different experience than some of the other programs that are similar. Um, the training is really extensive from technology to polar science to getting out to a permafrost tunnel. Um, seeing the aurora with other teachers was fantastic. 
hanging out under the pipeline for a little bit. Um, it's a really interesting experience. And at the end of it, I was already convinced that it had been one of the best professional development experiences of my career. Um, and that was before I even was getting ready for going in the field. Um, a few months later in April, I was fortunate enough to go to the Polar Educators Conference in Montreal, um, where a group of educators from, I believe, 70 countries came together and um, got together, exchanged some ideas, talked about polar education and what we can do to improve polar education and what people are doing in polar education. But, the, but that was also along with the IPY conference in Montreal for the International Polar Year. So it was nice getting to attend a science conference as well um, and listening to folks speak about the work that they're doing in the polar regions. Um, there is a new group and that polar educators at gmail.com. I encourage you to take a look at that. They also have a Facebook page and Janet and Sarah are very um, active in that group. It's a great group to be a part of. You get some good resources, um, get involved in what's going on in polar education. And for educators out there, I strongly encourage you to do that. OK, I was just checking where I was. Um, why study the polar regions is a question that comes up from a lot of people. Um, you know, why are you in the Arctic for this, or why are we sending people to Antarctica? And right now, the National Science Foundation is putting a special emphasis on studying the polar regions, um, because understanding them is really key to understanding global processes, especially in a time of, um, of a changing climate on a global scale. Did you want to? No, just on, on the slide, there are just some of the major yeah. reasons why we're interested in the, in the polar regions. Um, and uh, a lot of them is there's just a lot of unknowns about the polar regions, and also that, that these ecosystems are, like Nick mentioned, major drivers of, uh, of global processes. Yeah. This should be good. I'll put down the talk button. OK. Uh, so to give you an idea of where we are right now, uh, we're at Tulick Field Station. And it's about, and I'll talk more about Tulix specifically and what we have for facilities here, but just to give you a sense geographically, we're about 160 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Um, so we're, we're quite a ways up there. We're not quite as far as Christina is right now in Barrow. Um, so she's one of the few people that I can ask how things are going up there at this point. Um, there's not too many people up from us uh, in terms of being north. But yeah, we, we are a ways north. We're, um, about 110 miles from the Arctic Ocean. And right now, there are about 80 people um, working and living here in our camp. And to get here, um, the trip alone is quite an experience. We drive up the Hall Road, which you might be familiar with, from um, a, couple of, a couple of seasons of the show Ice Road Truckers. That was the featured road. Um, it's, it's quite a road. Uh, it makes the potholes in the Carolinas seem like nothing. Uh, it's really, um, it's paved in sections, in some sections, but actually I think the paved sections are worse than the, worse, the yeah. dirt. Um, but we did drive up here in an NSF truck, and it's really quite a cool experience. You get to, um, it takes about nine, between nine and 12 hours, depending on how often you stop for photos. And uh, if you hit construction, because believe it or not, they do have construction. Um, but, you know, we get to cross the Yukon River, and you can see that up here. Um, in this picture. And then, of course, entering the Arctic Circle is a great photo op. Um, we had to stop there once we cross the Arctic Circle. But what's really amazing is you're going through a boreal forest, and you get closer and closer to the Brooks Range, which is just some of the most beautiful scenery I've, I've ever seen that goes on for hours. Um, but as you're getting closer and closer to the Brooks Range, the, the vegetation is changing significantly. And then you finally get to a point where you see the last tree on the Hall Road, and it's the northernmost tree. Um, and then that's it. The Brooks Range pretty much cuts it off. Once you come down the other side of the Brooks onto the North Slope, it's nothing but tundra. Um, and it's just a completely open, treeless landscape that well, we'll be showing quite a bit up here in a few minutes. Um, and this is Tulick Field Station as we pulled in. And the reason I like this picture is the lake at the time, Tulick Lake, was completely iced over. And it's completely gone now. And that was within a matter of probably two yeah, two weeks of being here, it went from completely ice covered to thaw. So it's really a, 
you see a very accelerated spring, not only in terms of ice melt, but in terms of plants as well, which I'll get to in just a minute. Um, yeah, Tulip Field Station, just to give a little bit, it's, um, that's, I love that picture of it, and uh, it's beautiful, beautiful surroundings here. But it's um, the only long-term ecological research station um, in the Arctic. A tundra research station. American, American, yeah, that's right, American one in the Arctic. Um, but yeah, it's really a unique place. It's um, operated by the University of Alaska at Fairbanks um, Institute of Arctic Biology. And like I so said, we have about 80 people here now at peak. You can get up to about 150 people. Um, we've fluctuated between 70 and 100, somewhere in there, since we've been here. Um, but people do work and live here. It's quite remote, so it has to be a self-sustaining little town, more or less. Um, to sh give you a sense of housing, there's a very small dorm uh, pictured up in this top left corner, and uh, that has what? maybe ten rooms. Yeah, um, all doubles, but maybe ten. I guess that that one's for short-term housing. Yeah, and then um, we have these ATCO rooms also. Which those are double. Mm -hmm. yeah. also double. double. I think all, all the rooms are uh, meant to be double occupancy, but they try not to, especially for the longer term residents. Yeah, they're good to those of us who are uh, here for a period of time. Uh, down the bottom left, you can see Tent City, and you do have the option of pitching a tent and staying down there. Um, and there's, you know, I've seen between four and maybe a dozen tents down there. At a time, it's down by the lake. It's really beautiful. You get a little bit more. Um, Oh, you have to talk a little louder. Yeah. <laughs> All right. um, you do get a little more privacy there. Uh, what I'm in is over here. These are on the top right. Um, these are the Weatherport tents, um, and you can get a sense of the view that we have from there. I really like that. My my door opens up to the Brooks Range, and the Weatherport tents are a little more spacious. Uh, we do have little space heaters in there, but I haven't really had to use it very much. I've felt lucky about that. Um, you can walk in them. You, even I can walk in them, and I'm quite tall. Um, my room is set up for three people. I had a roommate for one week, and that was it. But on the other half of it, um, you can see in this bottom picture, that's basically a, a tarp separating my section from the section that's occupied by another person here at camp. So you get a sense of privacy, but you hear everything through these walls. So, um, But I, I've really enjoyed staying in one. I guess there was a question about uh, oh. the the camp in the winter, it's only recently been opened for the entire winter, and so now I think they keep four staff at all times over winter, and they're usually just a couple of researchers, but I think in the next few years there are going to be a lot more researchers coming up during the winter as um, there are better facilities and more facilities to keep, uh, to keep researchers here. There are a lot in the early spring when people are looking at snow melt um, and nutrients and whatnot with snow patterns. Um, lab space, it's, it's really different than I expected, and uh, there, there are no permanent structures here, um, and that's something we'll talk about in just a second, but our labs are either trailers or tents, largely. Um, the one that we work in is Lab 7, and I just placed the planer on it, it's right there at the end of this row. Um, it's a tent, it's really neat to work in, there are no lights in it um, because well we, we don't need lights 24 hours of daylight but there's there are things we do like scope work where it's better to move to a place that actually has artificial lighting and some of the trailers do um, but even with the trailers they're fully equipped labs in a lot of regards but most don't have running water so that's something you have to make an allowance for and learn to work around we wash dishes with jugs of water in buckets mm -hmm. um, but you can see this is, uh, this is lab eight is in the top right, and basically that's what our lab would look like when they tear it down um, so that you can get them through the winter time. And we have uh, some older structures. Here's a military type one from the 50s that we spend a fair amount of time in. Um, we lovingly refer to it as the dungeon, but you can see the lake from it, and it's actually kind of nice. It's just really old. Um, but yeah, and here is a row of uh, both in the bottom right trailers mixed in with tents. So it's, it's a lot of structures. And Amanda, do you want to explain why there aren't any permanent structures here? 
Well, so there are a couple of different reasons. First of all, we're on permafrost, so the ground is, is frozen all year long. And so with the freeze thaw, it's really difficult to build um, permanent structures without having, I think Nick has another slide that he'll show you with the dining hall, the way that they have to account for the different freeze thaw and the ground sinking and whatnot. Um, but also, the Tula Field Station doesn't own this land. We, we lease it from the Bureau of Land Management. And so our area of impact has to stay uh, within the, the gravel pad that the station is on. So we're not allowed to expand our space. And so that way, when, when new structures go up and we have to change things, um, it means that we have to shuffle the existing buildings and tents around. So um, everything needs to be somewhat, somewhat mobile. Yeah. And, and again, it's, um, it's people living, living here as well as working here. So, and, and some people for quite a long period of time, um, talking to people who will be up here for three months at, at a clip. So, it has to be a self-sustaining village, and it really, it, it is. We have a lot of um, nice amenities here, certainly. You know, everything from an EMT, I don't want to say shack, but that's what we call it. Um, this is the Tulick Health Club. It's basically a garden shed with some equipment in it, but it is nice to have as an option when it's too buggy to get exercise outside. Um, we have a couple of fully functioning shops, people um, building different pieces of equipment for the work that they're doing, but also modifying the work that they have. So it's a lot of, uh, it's neat to have those options here. Um, and we do have, you know, we have recreation facilities. We do have a sauna. Um, it's a wood-fired sauna, and I know that seems like holy luxuriousness kind of thing, but um, really the, what it came down to is until a few years back, they didn't have any showers here at all. So, and we're only allowed two showers a week at two minutes a shower max. Um, and I'll get into that in the next slide of why, but this, this sauna functions as a shower largely. You can go down, heat up, heat up some water along with you, and then take a bucket shower out on that deck. Um, so it's one of the more popular features here, I think. Yeah, and especially the people that have been working here a long time, they don't use the actual showers. Um, yeah. People wash with the sauna. Um, I noticed we have another question. Uh, the tents are not insulated. Some of the tents have uh, double layers, um, but for the most part, they're not insulated. And uh, I think in the winter, um, people use more of the the trailer type lab spaces, and then in the summer we usually don't need it, but we have uh, space heaters available when we do need them. Yeah, yeah. We had a day of uh, we had a bring your heater to work day, um, so all three of us went and grabbed our heater on a day that it was snowing and kind of just gathered around them. But then we kind of blew a circuit and decided plugging in three electric heaters was probably not the wisest thing we'd done, but uh, no harm, everything was fine. So, um, and I do want to point out the dining hall, which is where we're sitting now, is in the East Dining Hall. Um, and this is a real benefit, I think, for the, one of the big benefits that I didn't realize until I was here for the scientists and the staff working here, is having a cooking staff. Um, so that you don't have to worry about shopping, cooking, cleaning. It's done for you. And, um, and the food is outstanding. I and mean, it's really, it's the one thing I heard about from so many people before I came here. But, um, it really has led, it's lived up to all of the hype. We eat quite well, um, in fact, too well sometimes. Um, and even we have a nice place to eat outside before the mosquitoes get too bad. Um, it's really, it's a beautiful deck overlooking the lake and the Brooks Range. So it, you get a sense of how lucky you are to be here when you're sitting in a setting like that. Um, but we are, you know, we are on the tundra, and sometimes I think you forget that uh, being here that, you know, it's, it's work and you're, you're going and moving every day. But um, this is the bottom of the building that we're sitting in, and it's on jacks because we're on permafrost, and um, with permafrost thawing and freezing, et cetera, you get a little bit more settling in the ground than you would, say, in the lower 48. So this building was put on jacks, and you can literally jack up the building in places when you need to using a large wrench. And they checked that with a laser level periodically. Um, I was told the first year that this building was up, it sank four inches on the back side. Um, so that's, it's just another way, another modification for allowing us to be in a part of the world where it's a little different to be. Um, and also because it's, the ground's permanently frozen, water pipes have to be run above ground. We have plenty of fresh water coming in. Um, we have a well here, and the water's great, and it's, um, but it has to be run, all the pipes have to be run above ground. 
and the water is kept circulating in them to keep it fresh, certainly in the wintertime when the water use is very low, but also to keep it from freezing. And I'm told also there are some um, electric heat, some form of electric heat within it, so that if it does freeze, they can thaw that water and not have bursting pipes and run into those problems. And um, you want to mention what happens to our wastewater? <laughs> yeah, our wastewater, all of our wastewater has to be hauled out to Crudeau Bay at a cost of about $1.25 a gallon. Um, so we're very conscious of water use here. It's why we're limited on showers. Um, these are, this is one of the three towers. It's basically a pit toilet. Um, so we, it's above ground, you can see, and we have to walk upstairs to use the pit toilet because, well, the, the pit is actually above ground. It's a, it's a tank. Um, and uh, oh, Sarah asked how far Prudhoe Bay is. It's what, 100 and I think 117 miles. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's about a three-hour drive. Yeah, so it's it's expensive. I mean, they bring in large trucks, and I do have an entry on. They give some of the numbers. I asked um, some of the staff here to help me out with that in terms of how many times they empty these tanks and how much water do we use. And it's it's really quite amazing. Um, those tanks get pumped out, and the average water use here is about 13 gallons per person per day. They monitor just about everything. So 13 gallons might sound like a lot, but the average water use um, for people in the U.S. is 100 gallons per person per day. So we're very water conscious here. Um, and it's, you know, and in some cases, it's not making huge sacrifices. It's turning off the water while you soap up in the shower. It saves a lot of water. Um, I'm certainly not going to be building a, a tower in my backyard to save water, but you know, I'm also not paying a dollar twenty-five a gallon to ship it out. Um, trash too has to be hauled out, so we do incinerate a good amount of trash. We have recycling, but even with that, we crush our cans to um, reduce the volume of waste—well, not waste, but recyclable material that's being shipped out. Um, but we do separate the remainder of our trash into burnable and non-burnable. It's really um, the, the costs and other other costs really associated with shipping it out are quite high because we really are in quite a remote spot. And also, I think this is one of my favorite things here. Um, you know, I heard the phrase "land of the midnight sun," and it really is. It's it's really one of the coolest things to me. Um, I didn't know how I was going to adjust to it. I was worried about sleeping, etc. I'm, I'm sleeping fine. Um, I'm sleeping a lot less, and I'm finding a lot of people I talk to find that you require less sleep with 24 hours of daylight. It's really it gives you a lot of energy. Um, you get a second wind. I do anyway around seven at night, and I'm ready to go. And uh, it's fun. This this uh, picture in the bottom left that was taken right around midnight. Um, we were out playing some t-ball in the parking lot, and uh, we do have some fun recreation going on because you know it's it's where we are living as well as working. Um, this bottom right picture is not the clearest because I'm looking straight into the sun with that um, through a screen. Don't worry. But it, uh, that's about the lowest I've seen the, the sun in the sky. It will actually set before I leave, um, briefly, mm -hmm. it should. But it is neat to see the sun just go around the sky and take a dip in the sky. And it affords, you know, for scientists, you can work longer hours. Um, I went out with a bird crew at 2 a.m., which was fun. Um, and we can also go out for hikes after work and not have to worry about getting back in before the sun sets. Um, how warm was it here? Uh, it's been cooler the last week or so, maybe yeah. in the 60s or so. Yeah. It's warmer today. I mean, it snowed. It snowed yesterday on um, on a few people's hikes. Um, I didn't see it. But no, <laughs> we didn't get. We got rain on. Um, but yeah, and then we've we've had a couple 70 degree days though. It it changes really quickly though. Um, there our first couple weeks that we were here, it was just just absolutely beautiful in the 60s. It hit 70 a few days, and then um, a few days later it snowed. So it, the weather's really unpredictable. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, of course, the Arctic animals, and this is something I get asked about a lot, and it was something I, I've been quite excited about. Um, and all these photos are ones that I've taken since I've been up here. So um, from, you know, it's my favorite multi-species shot so far. Um, we have a, a fox eating a vole, and the voles are huge. Um, ptarmigans are some of the strangest little creatures that we have here. They're a bird that makes the sound that I, I can't even describe. It's, it's just strange. My first night I didn't sleep a whole lot because I, I was trying to figure out what that noise was. Um, I did get to do some fishing, and the, this is a grayling. Um, they're fun fish to catch, and the only fish in one of the rivers nearby here, they're pretty hardy fish. 
and, and all of these animals have, you know, they're well adapted to living in such an extreme environment. Um, of course, we've seen caribou and moose and um, a whole variety of insects, uh, a lot more than I think most people see here because we spend a lot of time looking at the ground. Um, tundra swans, which the first time they flew overhead, I thought it sounded like a pterodactyl would flying over. They're an awkward large bird, but beautiful. Um, and luckily I've seen, I think, the same marmot a number of times now. Um, we think we know where he lives. Mm -hmm. so, but yeah, it's really amazing. We spend a lot of time outdoors and we're in a very, um, very well-preserved area, so it's, it's just not that uncommon to see mm -hmm. really exciting wildlife. It helps that we're out there every day, too. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the flora and the landscape, this is, this is something that um, really is where I think I've learned the most. It's, it's a huge landscape with tiny plants. And the small things, I often, I would think of the Arctic with these large animals, um, you know, moose and bear and wolves, um, which we've also seen wolves. And, uh, you know, it's really not, I don't know if those play as important of a role as I originally thought. It's a lot of the small things and really some beautifully small things. You have lichen that are a, a bright orange, like a rust orange or a bright yellow. So there's really some beautiful um, plant material here and lichen and moss. And, and the landscape is just like nothing I've seen. Um, this top view, top center, that's what I look at right out the door of my weather port in the morning and reminds me of how privileged I am to be here. Um, certainly getting out and spending some time on some rivers while they were frozen, or in this case over here, under some rivers while they were frozen. Um, it was a fun experience. And, uh, you know, that's one of the big things here, and here's Amanda showing us, this was our first day out in the field, and she's explaining what tussock tundra is to us, and that's mostly what we have around here. Um, and I'd always thought, too, that it was, it's a, it'd be a very flat, homogeneous landscape. Um, and it's really, it's not at all. It's you have these big tussocks. Um, they're sort of like slightly deflated basketballs when you walk on them, but they're um, they're mostly dead plant material and roots uh, and, and clumps with the new growth coming out the top. And in this picture, you can see it's fairly brown. It was when we first got here. Um, but in between these inner tussock areas are flatter, wet, um, in some cases, yeah, mossy. So we're wearing uh, rubber boots and it's very, um, doing a lot of thunder slogging and there are days that yeah you, you get quite wet out there but it's then you step on top of these tussocks and they're sometimes they're crunchy so it's um and it's another thing and i know amanda you you've pointed out to me like how a the abiotic community here really drives the biotic community and that's something i don't know if you want to yeah, sure. It's just um, the, the environment here is so extreme that we really, um, all the researchers um, really have to pay a lot of attention to the physical characteristics of the landscape and the abiotic properties, the, the temperature and the snow melt and the nutrients. Um, and those are the, the factors that really drive a lot of what happens with the actual the, the flora and the fauna. And so um, it's just really interesting. You have to be very conscious of, of what's going on and what kind of environmental factors are, are at play. Um, and like Nick said, um, it's the same before I came. I like this, this picture at the top under the mountains. You think of the tundra and you think of this flat, homogeneous landscape. But on a small scale, it's really quite different um, inch by inch. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something you have to think about as well. Even when you're sampling or thinking about an experiment, are you going to sample the tussocks that are higher and drier or the intertussocks that are, are moist and wet and have a completely different plant community? Yeah. And we. Um, the, I've gone out with some groups that have done that look at uh, changes in plant growth over time, they do phenology, and they're looking at the seasonality of these plants. And the difference in two plots even that are maybe 100 yards apart, it's amazing. You'll see some plants are already starting to lose petals, and that same species 100 yards away, just because of snow melt or whatever other factor there may be, um, is just starting to bud. So it's really, there's a, quite a bit of variability, and I think it's because, you know, it is that very fast change in seasons. Um, you get spring, summer, and fall crushed into three months, three, four months. Yeah, I mean, we'll start to see the plants finessing already, uh, maybe not before Nick leaves, but by the beginning of August, you start to see some of the plants turning colors already, so it's a really accelerated summer. Yeah. And for Alex, I just saw that question. I do have, I have the sound of um, walking through the tundra. 
Uh, that's pretty good. Um, I, I really I was glad I could capture that. And I also have the sound of um, not this window, but another one. And uh, in the journal. The ptarmigan. Oh, the ptarmigan. No, no. I, yeah, the ptarmigan I'm trying to get some sound of, but I haven't seen one in a little bit. Um, plus, I don't really like purposely stressing them just so I can record them. I'd rather they, uh, they start making some noise. But uh, it, it is a really, really cool sound. Uh, we hear loons a lot at night, too, and that's one of my favorite things when I'm going to sleep. Um, all right, so now we're on to Team Spider. <laughs> Uh, just as Kiki stepped out of the room, but she'll peek back in, I'm sure. I didn't time that terribly well. Um, but yeah, Kiki will be back in, and she is uh, our research assistant who's worked with Amanda in her lab at Duke. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm Nick LaFave, and I teach science at uh, Clover High School in South Carolina. And, um, and I'm Amanda Colts. I'm doing my PhD at Duke University in Ecology with uh, Justin Wright's lab. Um, so yeah, it seems like maybe a strange place for me to put the, uh, the team introduction, but we are going to, um, we're going to get into the spider part a little bit now, and yeah, I, I like this photo also, who was complimenting us, but thank you. Oh, Janet. Um, yeah, it's, uh, this was on one of our hikes out to Attigan Falls, which is pretty close to one of our research sites, um, and it was, it's just a beautiful gorge that you hike up the river valley. It's, it's quite nice. There's a lot of good hiking around here, and it's one of the more popular activities um, when we're not working. So with the research project, um, with the wolf spiders, this is their basic food web. So a lot of people are saying, well, you're studying food webs, but well, you know, what are spiders eating anyway? Um, and the wolf spiders, they're the, they're the largest and most abundant um, invertebrate predator here in the tundra. Uh, yesterday while hiking, I saw several running underfoot. I think I tend to see more than I went out with a group of people not from my team, and many of them said they'd never seen spiders, but as soon as you look down, they're really scattering all over the place. Um, but just the same, I've gone out with bird teams, and I can't hear bird calls that they're identifying. So it's, it's just a different, I guess it's how, what you're tuned into and observing. Um, this has been one of the fun things for me to see going out with a variety of teams. Um, but we do know from other studies with the wolf spider, that the longer growing seasons that we're now experiencing are causing them to grow larger. Um, and what we like to look at, what we're interested in, is they're, if they're growing larger, are they having any impact on uh, any change in the food web? And more important, I think, is how that affects decomposition. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to add to the positive feedback? So. Sure, yeah. So um, decomposition, like since we're on permafrost and we have such a short growing season here, it means that the, these plants are growing, but they don't have time when they die. There's not enough time for them to decompose. So um, we have a picture later on showing you a soil sample, but the soil sample is it's basically just dead plant matter. There's not soil um, really in the sense of where you would have in the, the, the way that you would have it in the lower 48. Um, so you have all this like dead plant matter that doesn't have time to decompose, and one of the big worries with with climate change and warming in the Arctic is that the permafrost is going to thaw more, and there will be um, more time for that plant matter to decompose, and so this huge amount of carbon will be released as CO2 and methane as uh, decomposition more decomposition happens. Um, and that could cause uh, a more of a positive feedback with climate change. And so one of the things that we wanted to look at here was whether these small animals that are really abundant on the landscape um, could have any sort of uh, effect on, on rates of decomposition through indirect interactions in this food web um, that we have here. And so the wolf spiders here, because um, there are fewer plants and fewer herbivorous insects, the spiders are mainly feeding on, on animals from the decomposer food web and from the soil food web, and so um, potentially they could have some kind of, kind of indirect effect on decomposition. Yeah. And it's, um, I think being here this summer and seeing that, like Amanda said, the, what the soil really is made of was eye-opening. But also, you know, I've been teaching and heard a lot about um, the amount of carbon stored in the permafrost. And when we were up in uh, Fairbanks for orientation, we did get to go into a permafrost tunnel, which was really a neat thing for me to see a um, 20,000-year-old blade of grass that was still green and to see what it looked like. What does that carbon look like, that dead plant material, that dead organic matter that's sitting locked up, frozen in the, in the, underneath the tundra? 
um, it was quite neat. And it wasn't what I thought it would look like. It looked more like when you dig a hole to plant a tree. It looked a lot like that, um, except drier. So, um, methane carbon dioxide. Oh, yeah, that's what Christine said. Um, so, yeah, there, there are a lot of studies surrounding um, decomposition rates here. So, our research project um, centers on three main questions. And this first one, I don't want to read these to you, but this first question is really looking at um, environmental changes and feeding ecology within three, at three different sites that we sample at. We'll be going to all three today. So, um, and this is a picture of uh, our southernmost site, which I'll show you on a map in a minute. And uh, this little jagged part right here is called the molar. And that's where I went hiking yesterday. To the top of that, um, it's really a beautiful. All three of our sites are mm -hmm. quite scenic. Yeah, we've gotten lucky. <laughs> um, and you can see our flags down here at the bottom for where we do um, sampling for spiders, and we check um, spider density and prey abundance at each site. Um, and the next two questions are more or less. These are experiments that we do, and um, the, the second one here, we're looking at the prey, uh, which the collecting isn't all that difficult. It's uh, hours and hours on a microscope um, that, that are a little bit tougher. And then on this last one, we're looking at spider predation and decomposition. And we do that with um, our mesocosms up here on the hill, which I can actually see from where I'm sitting. Um, some mites. I think they are. Yeah, uh, Janet, yeah, they probably are eating springtails and mites. And maybe a few other things. Anything else they can find? Yeah. Spiders as well? Yeah, they, they are uh, cannibals as well. So here are three sites. Um, and I got the folks in the GIS office to lay these out on a map. Um, they're not very far apart, but they're very different. And that's what's amazing. This is um, this top one is here at Tulik. I can see it out the window here at the dining hall. Uh, it's about a 10-minute walk from where we're sitting through the tundra. Um, and uh, on the map, we're up here one of our two northern sites. Um, the second site is in Naviat, and it seems we're, we drive north on the Hall Road, but it's just it's due east of us. Right, yeah, it's about six miles east of us. Mm. But it's, it's very different in terms of um, snowmelt is what we look at here in seasonality because with the snow melt, um, it actually melts at our southernmost site down here in Attigan, and that's uh, Kiki and Amanda laying out some pitfall traps in Attigan Gorge. And um, the snow melts there first, and then it'll melt about a month later up here at Tulik, even though, what's the distance? It's, it's about 15 miles away. Yeah. Um, but Attigan is a more swin windswept landscape, even though it's closer to the mountains, mm -hmm. it's windier, so. Um, yeah. And then in Navi, it melts out about a week after Tulik. So even though it's not that far away, just the different positions with the mountains, different snow melt patterns, wind patterns, um, they end up having quite different growing season lengths than uh, snow patterns. Yeah. And we do, we have seen some significant differences between what we're observing at the sites. Um, when spiders are carrying egg sacs was what the first thing that I noticed. We would find, you know, when we were finding spiders with lots of spiders with egg sacs here, we weren't finding as many at our other sites. So it's, it does have an impact. And, you know, in Navia and Tulik, it's, it is the same latitude. It's just, it is that mountain structure. And even you see, like I said, so much variability just in a small area. That 15 miles or 6 miles is quite a bit. Um, and these are our um, mesocosms. And the nice thing about some of the stuff that I'm about to show you, especially here for the teachers, is a lot of this stuff you can do in some form in your classroom, um, depending on how far you want to run with it. But uh, these mesocosms, and I'm here testing uh, moisture and temperature of the soil, and that was early in the season. You can tell from how brown things were. But essentially, it's aluminum flashing like you would use on a roof. Um, and we use that to contain the spider communities and the, uh, as well as their prey and study them in a, in a small, closed community um, where we can manipulate some of the variables and certainly measure them. Um, half of our mesocosms, are, all of them, are basically made of this flashing. Half are covered with um, these OTCs, or open top chambers. 
And those are pretty commonly used in the Arctic for warming experiments. They're also used in um, alpine experiments where warming is a factor that you want to look at. And they act like mini greenhouses. They're made out of fiberglass. Um, they're difficult to get leveled to the ground here on the tundra. So we did spend a day playing in the mud mm -hmm. and uh, packing mud around them to insulate. But at the bottom, to make sure it was sealed. But they do warm the they do warm the mesocosm so we can look at temperature. So what we're looking at, we have um, up here at the top. These are our plot maps, and we do have uh, six mesocosms in each block. And within the blocks, half of them are covered with the OTCs, half are not. And then they're either a control plot, so we just leave them alone basically, or they're a high spider density where we try to double the density of the spiders in them by sometimes literally chasing spiders around in a field, picking them up in a cup and dumping them in there. Um, and then our low density plots, we continuously trap and remove the spiders that we find in there um, to look at the effects of each of those on decomposition and on the food webs. Did you want to add? No, it's about it. But, uh, we got a couple of questions. I thought that Don okay. asked, um, hi Don, uh, asked uh, about site selection. So for those three sites, that's no mountain growing season lengths were the main factors. Um, so basically in the study that Nick mentioned with the wolf spiders getting larger with longer growing seasons, um, that was from Greenland. But basically the spiders become larger because they, uh, with the longer growing season, just because they have more time to feed. And so um, I wanted to see whether the spiders would be having a different impact or have different type of feeding ecology where they had a longer growing season or shorter growing season. And specifically, we're also looking at um, where there's a longer growing season and you might have larger spiders that have um, more spiderlings, um, whether there are going to be higher densities and potentially higher rates of cannibalism. Um, but the site selection for this mesocosm experiment was um, we wanted to be close to the camp because building it was quite the undertaking. So we needed to haul all this fiberglass out and the aluminum flashing. So we needed to be within walking distance. And then Alex has a, a question as well. Um, yeah. So so we're just looking at wolf spider species here, and so there are um, there are a lot of other types of spiders as well. There are linifids and ground spiders. Um, the wolf spiders there are something around 10 to 15 different wolf spider species and. Um, Nick didn't get into it too much, but there are different kinds of tundra. So we work on moist acidic tundra, which is a tussock tundra, this kind of lumpy looking tundra. Um, but there's also dry heat that's um, drier and uh, more rocky. And so you find different, there's some overlap in the spider communities that you find between those two types of habitats, but they are different. But we're just focusing on the moist sites. Yeah. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this because I think we can do something very similar to this in the Carolinas. Um, the wolf spider is South Carolina's state spider. They're considerably larger in South Carolina. Um, but yeah, that a lot of these things we can collect data on. And there are some studies that we've actually looked at since we've been here um, in Kentucky. Yeah, so I, I took this idea of the aluminum flashing, making these little small world experiments with aluminum flashing. I took it from um, a group that was working in Kentucky. So it would be easy enough to implement yeah. in the lower 48 as well, as long as you have uh, some people willing to do manual labor to put the flashing <laughs> in. I find we often do. So that's good. Um, looking at this, uh, this is how we're looking at um, spiders and their prey primarily. Um, before I get into some of these things, this is, um, I'm holding a bread knife there. And uh, if you've done any soil sampling at all, you know that bread knives aren't typically what you use. You would core, and some people actually do core here. A lot of people do. Um, but Amanda prefers to use this method where we take a bread knife and slice what looks like tundra cake. Um, and it's really neat, and it's kind of when you think about trying to uh, slice soil, let's say, in the Carolinas and pick up that soil, it, it wouldn't stay all nice in a little cake like that. Um, it's nice, and this way when we're sampling, we're not disturbing the prey and they're not all fleeing from it as much as they would if we sampled by other means. So we'll take these uh, samples and bring them back to the lab where we put them in these Berlizzi funnels and uh, the ones that we're using, most of the ones we're using are made out of five gallon buckets. And um, I do have some ideas that I will be putting up with um, one of the lesson plans for Polar Trek on how to make these pretty inexpensively, um, but we use essentially incandescent lights uh, to drive them out with heat. Mm -hmm. We drive all of the uh, arthropods within the soil out to the bottom. 
they go out the funnel in the bottom, fall into a cup of ethanol, and then we sort through the ethanol and identify what's in there. So you can get a sense of speci um, what is in the soil, but also the abundance of the prey. And we, uh, we also use these pitfall traps. Essentially, this is, um, to be quite honest, it's a urine sample cup. Um, you could use other things, I'm sure, but we find that those have nice caps on them. They're easy to transport. You can get a consistent size. Um, but we put those tightly in the ground, level with the ground, try to hide them in. And uh, spiders and even their prey do run by and fall right into them. We collect a couple hundred at a time um, using these. So they work very well. They're very simple. It's a cool way to look at what kind of arthropods you have in your ecosystem. And again, I, I think these are great ideas for, um, for classroom teachers. Mm -hmm. We've also, um, we do monitor for some other things, of course, because uh, there, there's a lot of variables that we're looking at. And uh, this slide, to give you a sense of that, we have um, these, mon these little eye buttons. Uh, you can get a sense of how big it is by Amanda's hand there. They're, they're just these little, almost like wash batteries, mm -hmm. that ongoing monitor temperature. And we try to get a sense of the ground temperature, the temperature at ground level for the spiders. Um, so especially when we're dealing with OTCs, uh, the open top chambers versus none, that's, that's an important thing for us to know. Um, but we have those within each mesocosm. We have um, nutrient probes, so we can get a sense of nutrient availability in each one, especially because we are looking at decomposition. And I think another thing that, was really, that would be really easy to do are these leaf litter bags. And the Berlizzi funnels are used typically with leaf litter bags. That's, that's a pretty common way to use them, um, or with leaf litter rather than leaf litter bags. But Essentially, the soil here is leaf litter. Um, you don't get that sitting on top leaf litter like we do in other places. It, it becomes part of the tussock. So we um, will cut in and take that and, and use that instead. But that's um, basically it's hardware mesh. It's plastic. And uh, that's got some dried leaves in it, some leaf litter. And we weigh those, seal them up, um, bury them in each pot or in each uh, mesocosm. And then at the end of period of time, we'll take them back out and weigh them and gauge decomposition rates based on that. But it's a very simple thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the, the only hard thing was making them. We yeah. spent a couple of days uh, just sitting here, and here's Amanda um, soldering them together. And it's, uh, it works quite well. It's simple, but mm -hmm. it's a fun measure. And, uh, and again, it's, collecting this stuff is quite simple. I think the faster part of the work, it's not simple, I wouldn't say. I mean, it's hard to figure out how to. But the, the time-consuming part is the processing. And you'll be looking at this stuff for months mm -hmm. um, back in the lab. Yeah. Well, it's cute. He's been a big help. So hopefully he won't have quite as much work to do back with you. But still, there's a lot of lab time after work. And uh, I think just one last thing here real quick. And I, I won't take a lot of time on this because I'm noting the time. But it's. Um, I feel very fortunate to be here at Tulick because it's, you're surrounded by science. So whether you're sitting at dinner having a conversation with people about what they're studying or, um, you know, I went on a hike with people who study water tracks yesterday mostly and, um, and water chemistry. So I learned a lot just while hiking. And it's, it's a real privilege. And I've been really fortunate to go out with a number of teams. Um, I actually got to go out fishing uh, with a rod and reel. And I was helping a team out by doing that. They were taking me fishing, but I was helping them. It was a really neat feeling. And I learned a lot about um, how they're monitoring fish communities here. And uh, even going out with a bird crew at 2 a.m., um, I learned a lot of the bird species here in that time and learned some ways of doing citizen science with my students. Um, actually, these researchers here in the bottom right use data collected by students and citizens around the country. Um, and I, I'll have some information I'll be putting up on that and how to do it. Um, so you can do, definitely do some of these things with your students as well. And even here with the phenology, looking at plant growth over time, there's another, um, there are a couple of groups actually that have citizen science input of data where you're monitoring. I mean, even if you just monitored, monitored when the shrubs on your campus were changing over time, um, you know, your students, even at a low level, can contribute to science by collecting that data. Um, so yeah, I've been real fortunate. Everything from you know these teams to even just getting to lug equipment out to a site with a helicopter ride, I was more than happy to do. So oh yeah, Project Budverse. Thank you, Melissa, for saying that. Yeah, Project Budverse is a great one. I was actually looking at their site last night um, because one of the one of the uh, researchers here suggested that one to me. Um, 
So I think uh, we're good for questions. And I uh, just want to put up the folks we thank here. And for the sake of time, I'll let you read through those. Um, let's see. I guess we'll get questions. All right, great presentation, Nick and Amanda. Really interesting. So, um, as Nick said, we are ready for questions. I know, Cheryl, you have a group of people with you today um, that Nick was talking to, uh, other teachers. So, if you have questions, um, we are um, just click on the talk button and um, click it once to open the mic, and then click it um, when you're done talking. So we can turn it over to you first. If anybody else has questions, you can click on the little hand icon um, listed above the participants, and that lets us know that you want to ask your question live. Maybe, maybe not. Typing in her. Typing in her. Okay, um, Melissa. Yeah, I'm going to try to put up some directions for leaf litter bags. There's, um, I don't know if I've ever seen the type that we do here directions for them, but I, I've seen a number of other ones too. And these would be, we could write directions for it. Yeah, ours were the ones that we we're using this year. We just used window screening. So I just went to Lowe's, bought window screening, and then we just solder them together. It's really simple. Yeah. And I've used um, litter bags to actually collect invertebrates in ponds and streams. Um, and we used onion bags for that. So um, I collect onion bags every spring. And it, it is a neat way to collect things and see what you gather. And we sort through those by hand, but you could put them under a lamp, too. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Um. About, well, they eat, they eat each other, first of all. Yeah. And then um, Nick had a, an interesting activity that he had to do because of. Yeah, we, um, <laughs> birds like to sit on our OTCs and, um, and somewhat on our, just the mesocosms themselves. But the OTCs are slanted outward. So you can see where, um, you can see their droppings on them. And uh, we did have an idea one day to try to gauge if they were having any impact on our spider density. You know, were they feeding at the plots that had a higher spider density, or were they impacting the spider density in any way? So I actually got to go out one day um, with a notebook and count the number of bird droppings, and uh, put that into a spreadsheet and look if there was any correlation between spider density and amount of bird droppings. And, and there it turns out there wasn't. Um, but we much. did see that at two, two blocks we saw that there were significantly more birds yeah. uh, on, you know, in yeah. some of the plots than in others, in, in two particular areas. So. Yeah, it seemed, uh, it seemed more correlated to habitat choices for the birds mm -hmm. than it did to spiders, which, I mean, even that was just fun to do. It was kind of a cool thing to see. Um, it wasn't what we were expecting to see, but at the same time, we, we did learn something about why the birds may be choosing different ones. Mm -hmm. Oh, we've got a couple questions up. Let me scroll up. Um, where are we? Okay, so we can go down from here. Sorry, I'm just scrolling through trying to catch up on these questions over here. Um, let's see. May, how much leisure time do you have each day? That's a good question. It varies. <laughs> um, and it varies on who you are. I mean, it's not uncommon to walk through here at midnight, um, 1 a.m., and see people in their labs. It depends on the team, how long they're here, the nature of what they're doing. Um, we have some days that run very long. Um, and then, you know, we'll have other days where we can stop before dinner at 6 o'clock. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think it's important each day. I think most people do get out and do at least one enjoyable thing, even if it's brief. Um, right. it's, it's really expensive to work up here. So. Yeah. Um, just because it's so remote and because we have to ship all the food in, we have to ship all the wastewater out. So a lot of times researchers, like, we're fortunate that we're here for a couple months. Um, and so we try and have a somewhat more balanced 
lifestyle and, and try and finish by at least, you know, try and make sure that Nick and Kiki are finished by dinner time, even if I'm working at night. But um, you, know, you just have to balance yourself a little bit better. The, the groups that come in for a couple, two or three weeks, um, you know, they, they're really limited in how much time they have. So a lot of times they'll work till midnight or 1 a.m. every day that they're here. Um, let me see. And I, I do find, you know, people do tend to work, you know, people work six days a week minimum. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people work seven. So it, it is, people tend to work very hard here, but um, also there's, there are a lot of great recreation opportunities. And we also create a number of them. We'll play badminton um, at night and, you know, just find ways to uh, put some, some humor and some fun into the seriousness and the hard work that it is because it, it can be quite stressful for these researchers. It's, um, you know, you, you are only up here to collect data for a certain amount of time and like the fishing group that I went out with, they've lost a number of days now because we've had some flash floods. Right, and last week, for example, it's been, uh, we've needed to collect spiders for the last week and a half, but it's been cloudy and rainy and the spiders just don't come out. So today's yeah. our first sunny day, so yeah. it'll probably be a longer <laughs> run. Um, the most surprising thing that I've learned so far, I, I would say, and yeah, there's uh, Tom playing some t-ball, um, which is, that's just a lot of fun. I, yeah, we, we do have a good time. Um, the best way to teach, okay, let me see. Oh, the most surprising thing I've learned so far, okay. Really, I, I think, and, and I don't know if I so much was piecing it together as much until Amanda and I were talking yesterday about how, how much the abiotic community drives the biotic community here and how important of a, of a role that that plays. It's, um, this, you're getting on the edge of where it's comfortable, I think, or even possible for, to have these dynamic communities. Um, for things to live, you have to be very well adapted. And, you know, the differences we're seeing from site to site over a small area is really quite incredible and it's very much dependent upon these abiotic, these abiotic factors. Um, even things as simple as uh, sampling fish, we had to catch them with rod and reel because well the species can go underneath the banks to avoid you if you're trying to net them and you can't shock them as you can in a lot of other waters because there's just not enough conductivity in the water here. And um, the nutrient levels in the water here too are so low that they actually add fertilizer ongoing in parts for experiments. So a lot of these abiotic factors, I mean, as much as, yeah, we're here looking at a, a biotic system, you know, predator-prey relationships, there's a lot more to it than that. And that's just a small part of the picture. And I would say also that we're in the minority of groups yeah. here that are studying animals. Uh, most of the groups study these uh, physical abiotic factors a lot. There's a lot going on on snowmelt, on nutrient cycling, on uh, the plant communities and on shrub expansion, but um, yeah. you could probably count on one hand the number of groups that are studying animals here just because um, traditionally they're considered uh, um, less important drivers of, um, of ecosystem dynamics. Yeah. Maybe even the indicators of the change rather right, than, right. yeah. Um, the citizen research projects um, for Cheryl, that's something that, uh, that is a goal of mine to put together a list of those and some links. Um, I know there are a number of them out there and I've actually been exposed to a few of them through um, my experiences with Polar Trek and it was really fun to have two different, actually a bird person and a plant person here, researchers mention them and how they've either used them with their students at the university level or how they've used the data from it in their projects. So um, that's something that I'm trying to put together is a list of those and some links because I, I think it's a it's a fun way to get your students involved in making observations that are, you know, they're attainable for students at a high school or middle school level, um, but they're contributing to a bigger picture and some science that's actually, you know, even here where the naturalist here does a lot of ongoing fairly basic observations, but it's to provide the researchers with a set of data that they can use without having to spend the time going out and getting it. And a lot of times it's helpful to establish your baseline using that data. Yeah, that's how we picked our, our snowmelt sites were from very basic observations that were done by, by people here, informal, but still it helps inform where we choose our, our sites and, and where we're going to do our research. Yeah. Yeah, we were reading that. Um, that's, that's good. John. <laughs> My brother. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so, so maybe we might have problems with cannibalism in our plots. Um, that's one thing we're trying to figure out is that um, 
we're finding that the uh, that even though we increased the densities of the spiders in the plots, when we came back to this spring, we found that the densities had all evened out again. And I think it's just because there's uh, a maximum standing density of spiders, and um, you know they behave antagonistically toward one another. So if they if they run into each other, they'll run away normally. But since they're in an enclosed plot, it, it might be more likely that they eat each other. Um, and so, but that's also interesting because if spider densities are going to increase on the tundra, um, then they might be feeding on each other more and have less of an impact on the below ground community. So um, I think that there are fairly high rates of cannibalism in our, our plots that have double densities, um, but, but that's also interesting and it's going to help inform what we're doing. Um, and in terms of how often we sample, um, last year we sampled the, the prey three times during the summer, and this year we're sampling it twice, um, just to have a more manageable number of samples to process the rest of the year. Um, and uh, from Clover, we have the, yeah, the question of 24 hours of daylight and animal behavior. Um, what was strange to me is, I met a couple of researchers here um, as I was winding down my night. They were getting up to go out most nights, and that's how I got to know them and got invited out in the field with them. They were getting up drinking coffee at midnight. Um, but they, they would go out from 2 a.m. to um, 10 a.m. to do point counts for birds, and their feeling was that that's the traditional time to do it. That's when the birds are most active. Um, the sun does get low in the sky. Uh, lower, and when it does get colder around 2 a.m. Um, so I, I, there might be something to it, but I've also talked to other bird researchers who felt that you don't really need to do that here. Um, you can sample birds at various points in the day. So there, there are some different views on it, um, but you do notice a pickup in activity when it's, you know, brighter and warmer. And it, it depends on the animals, I, I imagine. I think late at night, I don't see as many wolf spiders running around, no. um, but we haven't been out at midnight that much this year yet. Yeah. Um, uh, the squirrels, for example, there are Arctic ground squirrels here, and they still maintain uh, a an actual schedule. So they um, they still get up at 8, 7, 8 in the morning, and they still go to bed. Um, and so it might be a different kind of schedule than down south, but they mm -hmm. still keep a schedule. And the, the people, well, <laughs> I think the people stay up more. Um, but then again, I, I happily think that would be true here no matter what, just because the people need to get work done. Okay. Anybody else have uh, questions there? A few more texts coming in. Yeah, this has been a really interesting. Okay. All right. Um, I think uh, it's time for us to uh, wrap this up. So uh, thank you, Amanda and Nick. Great job, and everybody else for joining. Yeah, thank you. Um, and if, continue to follow along, please. And if you have questions, send them to the Ask the Team forum. We've had a lot of really good questions, and uh, uh, we enjoy getting them. Yeah. Thank you very much for, for attending. Yeah. All right. Yeah, good job. I'm, I'm going to turn off the recording here. You can say.